I want to begin the message today. Um, and I wonder if I could just get a little bit of crowd participation as I, uh, as I intro this message today. I'm a little, little nervous, I'm a little rusty, and so I'm thinking maybe the audience can help me as I get the message started today. Can you commit to that before you even know what I'm going to ask you? Okay, six people is with me, okay? I want you to say one word, but I want you to say it four times, and that word is what? Can you say that? But I want you to say it, what? Don't enunciate it. Say it like this, what? All right. Yeah, I'll tease it just like that. But I want you to say it four consecutive times, real nice and strong, on the count of three. One, two, three. What, 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 what? Y'all did real good. Let's do that again one more time. One, two, three. What? Now, I don't know about you, but my blood pressure went up just a little bit. <laughs> this chant may not be familiar to you unless you went to Dunbar High School in the 90s, like me and Eugene did, right? If you heard this chant, what did it mean, Eugene? Somebody about to get down. Somebody about to, there's about to be some furniture moving. Somebody is about to fight. Now, if you didn't want any parts of the fight, you need to move away from the what's. But if you wanted to see the action, follow the what's. We also had a lot of fire drills in my high school. Some of them were planned, others weren't. And if somebody had a beef, got into a little scuffle, and they wanted their buddies to help, they'd simply pull the fire drill, Everybody would go out, and out there waiting would be their buddies. And when we all came back in with a few extra students, you could almost set your watch. In a few minutes, you would hear that what? 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 Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I wasn't much of a fighter growing up. I was a lover, not a fighter. And sometimes I would get into trouble for not standing up for myself. And my father would say to me, you can either deal with them or you can deal with me. He said, you better not start no fights, but you, but you better finish them. But it just wasn't my style. I was kind of a Sheraton church boy, afraid of my own shadow. But we all have a certain disposition toward fighting and conflict, don't we? It's dictated by our personality, how we grew up, where we grew up. What happened to us as we were growing up? This could all shape our disposition toward fighting and conflict. And some of us, because of our wiring, because of the way we see the world, we will avoid conflict at all costs, even to our hurt. Even when we need to speak up for ourselves and even when we need to speak up for others, we will avoid conflict and fights. It just makes us uncomfortable. But others of us, we sit on the other end of that spectrum, and you wake up in the morning looking for a fight. And your disposition is, I wish somebody would try me today. And of course, some of us fall someplace in between. I believe it's one of life's greatest challenges, though, to figure out when to fight and when not to fight. When to lean in and when not to lean in. It can be a real challenge, but I think it's really, really important for us to figure out how to do this. And so uh, it's with that in mind that I'm beginning a brand new series this morning that I'm simply calling Good Fights. Good Fights. And Paul urges young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 to fight the what? The good fight. And while there's a whole lot of truth that you can unpack from that verse, it minimally implies that there are also what? Bad fights. There are fights that don't rise to the level of being worth our limited time, attention, energy, effort, reputation. If there is a good fight, there must also be bad ones. In my work in disciplining my four boys that I had the privilege to raise, outside of talking to them daily, almost hourly, about their chores and responsibilities, their hair and their hygiene. One of the main things that I find myself coaching them on regularly is helping them to decide what's worth fighting over and what's not. 
And I found myself saying, man, you ain't got to respond to everything. Can't you see your brother is baiting you? Can't you see he's pushing your buttons? Don't swing at every pitch. Some things have to be beneath you, son. <laughs> Helping them to figure out what's a good fight and what's not. It can take quite a bit of time in life to figure out what fights are worth fighting and what happens to be just the knucklehead stuff. And luckily for us, the scripture is full of wisdom, stories, and instruction on how to know which is which. And this proves to be helpful on every area of life and our, fam excuse me, our family, our interpersonal relationships, our vocational life, especially the spiritual life with God and others. And today we'll look at one of history's most famous fights. We find this in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It is the story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath. This is people who don't even know about church, don't even know anything about the scripture. They probably heard somewhere about David and Goliath, and you hear this reference, it's March Madness, when a, a, a team upsets another team, or when a really popular team is facing up with a team that's not that popular, isn't expected to win, they will say, this is a real David and Goliath story. It's familiar to us, and also the danger in engaging a familiar uh, passage or familiar text is that we can think we know everything there is to know when God has plenty for us. And so I'm gonna invite you to lean in to this familiar story. It's a long passage that I have to read this, this morning. I'm not apologizing, I'm just preparing you uh, because I believe the Lord has something special for us in here today. I'm simply calling this message, David and Goliath, meet me in your Bibles in 1 Samuel chapter 17. While you do that, let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your truth. Thank you for the unique privilege it is for me to stand before your people yet again to bring your word. Father, we need to know the difference between a good fight and a bad one. Would you show us through the scriptures today? Would you help us? Would you teach us? May our hearts be soft landing places for your truth. Would you put power on these words you've given me to speak? Would you move the preacher out of the way this morning so that your truth and your light might shine through? We ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said... Amen. First Samuel chapter 17, I'm starting at verse 1. It says, The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko in Judah and Ezekiah at Ephes Damin, and Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with a valley between them. Verse 4, Then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the force of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the army of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrathite, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemiah, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son, and David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. Verse 16, for 40 days... Every morning and evening, the Philistine champion shredded in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for bat the battlefield with shouts and battle cries, and soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left th his things with 
keeper of the supplies and hurried out to the ranks to, get, to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunts to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? <coughs> Excuse me, the men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. That's a pretty sweet deal. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending this defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Skipping down to verse 31. Then David's question was reported to Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion and a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Boom. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Verse 38, then Saul gave David his own armor, bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such a thing before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. This is the word of the Lord. We'll finish the story in a little bit. But this is a fascinating story, is it not? Lots of detail and intrigue. A few things stand out that I want to highlight. Actually, a few people stand out in this story. And I think the people in the story will tell the real story if you uh, lean in and listen. The first thing or the first person I see in this story is one of the main characters in this story is Goliath the Intimidator. Goliath is, is the Intimidator in this story. And no story is really good. You notice every movie that's good, every story that's good, it has an enemy, it has a foe, right? You ever just find a story that doesn't have something to overcome, some enemy to beat? It's just a bland, boring, flat story. This has Goliath the Intimidator. He's intimidating because he's big and he's the biggest scary dude. He's a giant. Scriptures tell us he's over nine feet tall, and while sc scholars squabble over how tall he was, we know for sure that he was taller than anyone else in the Israelite army. He wasn't just big and scary. He was loud and audacious. Comes out to the Israelites, I'm the Philistine champion. Choose one man to come down and fight, and I'm going to take care of business, right? Now, this, is an this isn't an unusual war strategy. Right, to avoid lots of bloodshed and death it wasn't uncommon for one champion to say to the other army, hey, send me your best guy, I'll send you our best guy, and we can, most of us can go home. And so let's throw down. And so this is what's happening here. Goliath is bigger than everybody else, he's badder than everybody else, he's meaner than everybody else, and he is confident that he can handle this. He's loud and audacious, and on top of all that, He's being really extra, like my children. He's doing the most. Scriptures tell us he wore a bronze helmet, a bronze coat of mail, his armor's weighing 150 pounds, and I'm like, you're the biggest dude already. You won, man. Like, you got it. Why is he wearing all this? He's an intimidator, and intimidators love to look bigger than they are. Time will tell that he can't move and he can't be agile and all of this. Why is he wearing all this? All the commentators say, a man wants to look bigger than he is, scarier than he is, and guess what? It works. Because this is what intimidators do. This is what big, scary bullies do. He's doing the most. And often the good fights that we'll end up in in life 
and especially in the spirit realm, will involve the intimidators, the powers that be, that wish to throw their weight around, usually with evil intent. Goliath is the intimidators. No doubt you can look around the room of your personal life, your vocational life, our political lives, internationally, and we will find what? The intimidators that are throwing their weight around, big and scary, loud and audacious, doing the extra most is, trying to make us afraid. This is Goliath. Also in this story, we see King Saul and the Israelite army, and they are the afraid. They're fearful. They are scared. I'm talking about Saul and his army. Now, this is the army of the living God, God's chosen people. They are afraid. Verse 11 tells us that when Saul and the Israelite army heard Goliath's taunts, they were terrified and they were deeply shaken. Now, can we talk about King Saul just for a minute? Like, Saul's the king, and if there were no takers for Goliath's challenges, at least by default, the king should step out and say, I guess i got to go earn my, earn my keep today because I'm the king. Not to mention that in 1 Samuel chapter 9, it, it tells us that Saul was taller and more strapping than anybody else in Israel. So he was the obvious physical choice. Though he wasn't Goliath's size and girth, he would, but it would have been the obvious choice to face Goliath. And yet, he, like his men, were afraid. Now, I want to make it real clear that I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not casting stones. I'm not throwing shade at Saul and the Israelites' uh, army because given the circumstances, given the big and scary nature of their opponent, let me say with all honesty that I get it. I get it. Have you ever been scared of something? I mean, like really afraid of something? Maybe there's a person or a situation or a diagnosis or something big. If you've ever been scared, you know it is what it is. You're scared of what you're scared of. You're afraid of what you're afraid of. But I think that we must examine our fears because our fears reveal a lot, don't they? Our fears, if you get them up on the autopsy table, if you do the forensic analysis of our fears, it would tell us a lot about a lot. Minimally, our fears disclose to us what we're afraid of, sure, but it also reveals what we don't trust in, what we don't hope in, where we've lost hope, or we've chosen or not chosen to lean the weight of our faith, if we look a few steps below the surface of the thing that actually scares us, the things that actually intimidate us, and t- intimidate us it really could tell the story of our faith and who that faith is in and who that faith is not in. It reveals where our passions lie. It reveals where our allegiances are. There's lots of information packed into what what frightens us. And so if we look at King Saul and the Israelite army, before we wag a finger in their face or speak in an accusing tone toward them, they are us. That is to say, a lot of times when we approach this story and we're trying to locate ourselves in this story, who do we want to be? I'm David. You are not David. (laughs) You are not David. I am not David. If we're anywhere in this story, who do you think we are? We are King Saul and the Israelite army, knees shaking, body quaking. They are us. But then there's another character in the story, David the unlikely hero. This little ruddy, scrappy David emerges, interestingly enough, as the hero of this story. And what's super interesting to me is that my man didn't even come near to fight. He didn't even come near to fight. Verse 17 tells us he came to bring some baskets of roasted grain, five loaves of bread, 10 cuts of cheese, 
and to bring back report to the old man about how the brothers are getting along. That's what he was supposed to do. But he was a man after God's own heart. And he couldn't unsee what he saw when he got there. He couldn't unhear what he heard when he arrived there. And I must remind you, if you've forgotten or you never knew, that in the previous chapter, David was anointed the new king of Israel. God had rejected Saul for now obvious reasons. And young, ruddy David, who almost didn't even get seen because he's like not the obvious choice for king, recently anointed the new king of Israel. But he's not the king yet. He's just a boy. He's just a shepherd. He's just bringing some food. He's going to give us by, give a little report. But we are who we are. And when he arrives, something happens that flips a switch in this young shepherd boy. When he arrives, something happens to get this young ruddy boy in a fighting mood. You ever been in a fighting mood? Something happens. Verse 23 says, As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks, and then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. Remember, this is day 40. This clown has been carrying on for 40 days without any corresponding response. David asked the soldier standing in by, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? David is beside himself. Not to mention a little confused, he's confused Uh, uh, for two reasons primarily. Goliath the intimidator with his disrespect and irreverence. Man, David is talking to his buddy. Is he here as Goliath? He said, wait, maybe he had to take an earbud out or something and say, what did he say? He talking to us? He talking about Yahweh? So that's the one thing that confused him. He can't believe this guy is popping off like this. What's equally confusing is David can't put together why somebody hadn't gone over there and hit this dude in the mouth already. (laughs) Why y'all so comfortable with this? It's been going on for 40 days. See, David's new to the scene and he hasn't gotten well adjusted to these threats. He hasn't got well adjusted to this giant and his irreverence and his defiance. It's new to him, and rather than get well adjusted to the thing that's supposed to anger him, that's supposed to get him in a fighting mood, he responds differently. Unlike the Israelite army, I'm guessing on day one when when, when Goliath came out of it, it was a real shock to their system. They were like, "What, what did he say? He's insulting God. Let's take up arms and let's deal with this. Let's pick somebody, whatever he wants to do, let's deal with this. If we die, it'll be a valiant death because we will be defending the honor of our Lord. But day two and day three and after day five or six, it's just background noise. They've gotten well adjusted. And I wonder what you might have gotten well adjusted to that God never intended you to be well adjusted to. What patterns and dysfunctions and intimidations in your life that used to first be shocking to you? They would first seem like the thing you're supposed to rise up in a good fight and deal with, but over time, as you settle into that thing, over time, as it just continues on, as it, over time, as you get comfortable with it, come on, th- th- it's just background noise now. And here, sitting in your midst, is something that God is challenging us to deal with. This is a good fight, and the Lord would go with us, but we've gotten ourselves. Well adjusted, not so for David. For David, this is a good fight. It checks all the boxes. It's noble, it's righteous. This pagan Philistine is not just defying the army of God, he is defying the God of this army, Yahweh. I'll say that again. 
He's not just defying the army of the living God. He's defying the God of this army, and David knows that something has to be done. This isn't a spat between two armies. It's not a spat between two men. It is a clash of darkness and light. And David, a man after God's own heart, cannot and he will not pass this up. Now, this is super interesting, and if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. This is super interesting because if you haven't put it together yet, David is an Old Testament Christ figure. Can you see it? David is an Old Testament Christ figure. This is a picture of Christ. Despite how big and audacious and scary Goliath is, the champion is not darkness and death, the champion is Jesus Christ. Though sin and death and darkness is defeated and perpetually defeatable, despite how big and scary it looks, this story, this David represents Christ. As he will come on the scene, full trust and humility to God, surrender to God's will, moving in the power of the Spirit, though he's fully human, he engages the mission of God, empowered by the Spirit, to defeat our greatest foe, sin, Satan, demons, the kingdom of darkness. David represents Christ. And he's bigger than any foe. And like David, Jesus was unassuming. Like David, uh, Jesus from Bethlehem. Like, like, like all the boxes get checked. So this is one of the most misapplied stories. It's easy for us preachers to get up here and teach about how this, you face your giants like David. That's not the goal of this story. The goal of this story is so that you might see Christ is bigger and stronger than anything else. Yes, Goliath is strong, but God's stronger. Yes, sin and darkness and the pull toward it is big and strong, but God is stronger. Yes, it's great, but Jesus is greater, and that same power is in us. And when you encounter trouble, and when you encounter the intimidators, think of this story. Remember this story and how it ends. Because in verse 40, David faces the giant, not with Saul's armor, but with who and how God made him. Verse 40, he picked up five spooze stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer and ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come to me with a stick? And he cursed David by the of his God, small g, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. Still talking, still being loud, still being audacious. Let's see how this ends. Verse 45, David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. This is how you talk to the intimidators. This is how you speak when you know the Lord is with you. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reached into his shepherd's bag, taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled out Goliath's sword from his sheath, his sword, because David didn't have one, and used it to kill him and to cut off his head. And I don't have time to read the rest of the story, but the Israelite army, blew their hopes encouraged, buoyed by this act of, uh, of courage and defiance against the intimidator, they go and they rout 
the Philistine army. Is this not a great story? And David challenges not just the Philistines, but anybody who will ever hear this story to put some respect on Yahweh's name. And to know that the Lord is mighty. Something was awakened in this young shepherd boy that will carry all throughout his reign as the king of Israel. And worship team, you can make your way up as I land the plane here. Don't miss the point. If you're leaving here thinking that this was a message to inspire you to go out and to do hard things, go out and face my giants, I suppose that you can glean some courage from that, but that is not the point of this message. The point of this message is to have you to go out and trust God. And before you land in that place, you might first have to do uh, an examination of what you're afraid of and to see what those things are and let that reveal to you in a gracious, helpful way what you don't trust, namely the true and living God. Go out and be more certain of God's greatness and his power and might. Go out and be more certain that if we align ourselves with God's causes and when we come up against the enemies of God, that God will be with us if we engage in what? Good fights. Now look, in a room this size and those watching us online, I know that we, we, we come in carrying a whole lot of stuff. If I just pass the microphone and you were able to list the things that are standing up as intimidators in your life, if you had to list the things that you were afraid of, and you had to detail your lack of faith in the true and living God, and if you had to detail all the things that you have gotten well adjusted to rather than standing up in courage and leaning in with the power and might of God. Like, we'd be here all day because we all got something. But I hope that you would leave today with a renewed hope and a renewed faith in our God that he is strong and that he is mighty and that he is bigger than anything that you can face. All the things that might rise up and intimidate you, all the things that might keep you scared and shaking, we serve the one true and living God. And as we worship God with this final song today, I want you to bring your fears to him. I want you to get in your mind those intimidators. And I want you to bring before the Lord a confession that, Lord, I have not trusted you. That I haven't leaned the full weight of my life in faith on you. And what we say each week, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. This isn't to shame you, but this is to help you understand who's on our side. Who we are and whose we are. So that we would live the victorious life.